it also shouldn't be coming out just like liquid. Or pebble dashing everywhere. Or pebble dashing. If you're pebble dashing, then yeah, you've got some issues going on somewhere. Welcome to the Gym and Tonic podcast with me, Tim Chase. And today I'm joined with the trainer of personal trainers. He is Mr. Dean, and I won't butcher your surname. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that because a lot of people do when they're on the phone. <laughs> How you doing, buddy? I'm good, man. I'm good. How are you? I'm very well, very well. Yeah, it's been a it's been a long, busy couple of weeks. Hence, why the podcast hasn't been on for two weeks. But it is back with uh, well, a guest. I'm very excited to uh, to talk to. Oh, so, thank uh, you very much, mate. <laughs> do you want to tell the uh, tell the viewers who you are and uh, a bit more about yourself? Okay, so my name is Dean Rahman. I've been a personal trainer since, when did I qualify? 2006. So I've been in the industry coming up 15 years, which you don't find too many of us that have been about that long. Um, <laughs> I feel like I'm well, like one of the old men in the game now. It's, it's horrible. Um, but during that time, since 2006, I've gone through... I've had so many different influences in the fitness industry from uh, like bodybuilding to nutrition to functional movement patterns and functional movement screens to like full on like massive anatomy, just like overloads in terms of like how the body actually moves. Uh, and in the last, I'd say probably four or five years, <clears throat> it's all been about biochemistry, stress, hormone levels, uh, neurochemistry, so what is actually happening inside your head on a physical level as well as an emotional and uh, a, a chemical level as well. So it's understanding for me now how the body actually does what it does and what drives our behavior to either push us into a healthy lifestyle or an unhealthy lifestyle. And in between that, I've also done a, a qualification to then be able to teach uh, people to become personal trainers um, so I do a lot of teaching of people who either want to change their career or just are fresh into the industry they've never had a career they want to be a personal trainer I will take them through that journey to, to become a PT uh, and I also do <laughs> lecturing for personal trainers as well so I provide like the continued education for, for PTs to learn from and you've sat in on a couple of those sessions, so you know that they're, uh, they, they can be intense. <laughs> yes, yeah, since I haven't actually sat in one of yours for a while, it's, uh, it's been missed. It's, you know, reminding the things that I did previously know and then, you know, telling me the, the latest research and new information. I think it's amazing that you, you've now gone down that route because, you know, we get so obsessed with just the calories in, calories out, put the hard work in, just man up and do it, and we forget quite often the emotional and the mental side behind uh, this, you know, the sort of process oh, okay. of change. Oh, and, and the thing is, as well, is like when you're looking at emotion, it's emotion that drives probably 90% of behavior. There's a minuscule percentage of people that will actually be able to override emotion to listen to that logical side of the brain and say, no, do you know what? I'm not going to buy the chocolate at the till which is reduced because I'm on this set path and I need this set result. It's a real small percentage of people. Yeah, no, it, it is tiny. So I'm just making notes of what I'm, I'm thinking of questions now as you're talking. So I'm like, right, we, I don't want to forget <laughs> that. So before we sort of delve into your role as a sort of PT mentor, because I know that's kind of the direction you've been going in um, recently, sharing your knowledge after years in the industry. Um, have you noticed any sort of changes in the industry? I know we haven't, I didn't, feed you this question earlier but have you sort of noticed any big changes um, with yeah, the training it's, fitness industry yeah the the, sh the the biggest thing that i've noticed over time is that shift into embracing technology and embracing online training and that shift has been huge and that's one of the biggest trends that i've noticed and with that Good trainers and good PTs have, have done really well and they still provide a really good service to their clients. 
but it's also given rise to what I call the insta famous fitness twat who they, they've got a shredded good looking body but they know fuck all about what they're actually telling people to do they use a cookie cutter template system for nutrition they're taking money off people who are vulnerable and they're just giving them a, a random template to give these people food and to give them a training system without knowing somebody's blood pressure, without knowing somebody's hip to waist ratio, without knowing how stressed somebody is, without knowing if they've got any food allergies. You know, and that insta famous fucking fitness twat is probably going to end up in the bin. I've, I've been trying to narrow down my bin choice for like two weeks. I've got, I've got, one, <laughs> got one related. Um, yeah, no, I, I love what you're saying there because it, it, it makes, me, makes me a little bit angry because I've been in the industry, I don't know, the best part of maybe 12 years now, training for sort of 17. And I still feel of myself as a little bit of a fraud when, you know, you look at the, the knowledge that certain trainers have in the industry and you think, oh my God, I don't know half as much as that. But one thing that I know I do, and obviously all the trainers in, in the gym that um, we've PT'd out of do, is really sort of taking into consideration these little things about client preference, client lifestyle, rather than just going, there it is, there's your deficit, get on and do it, which is what I'm seeing a lot of. And I think that's what you're getting at is the cookie cutter. There's a thousand calories, man up, go and do it. You're going to lose weight. But what about the aftercare? You're going to be a complete fucking mess. Yeah. And one of my mentors, like one, like his big thing is, okay, you've done a 12 week transformation. Okay. You've done 12, 16, 24 weeks into a show. Where are you 6, 12, 18, 20 weeks after that photo shoot, after that contest, or after that weight loss? So, you know, where is your after the after picture? Normally, yeah, a mess. Have, you, have, most people. Yeah. Ha, have your results been sustainable? Because anyone can drop down to a thousand calories, do three hours of cardio a day, and get fucking shredded. Well, first time they do it, they will. Yeah. And a lot of, a lot of what I do now is actually help people recover from bad coaching for contest prep. I've dealt with girls, their hairs have been falling out, yep. their uh, periods have stopped. They've just, uh, <laughs> the worst case I've ever had, there's uh, a coach prescribed this girl, uh, or he told her, so he dropped her down to like 900 calories a day, told her to do faster cardio in the morning, a weight session in the evening, and when that stopped working for her for fat loss, he then said, oh, you're going to have to start doing some gear. Yeah. And I was just like, what is going on? Like, how, why are you paying this person? Yeah, because you, like, you, you could tell yourself to do that. And the, and the thing you're then being left with, which we're going to go into later, is then that health, uh, sorry, that mental health aspect where they are completely just messed up in the head because now they don't want to get, they can't eat any food. They're worried they're going to put fat on. Um, and they think that they're putting a bit of fat on is unhealthy when you've got to re-educate them that you're doing some serious damage. Oh, hey, honestly, the, 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 I've heard one guy that freaked out because it, he had like 126 grams of chicken on his plate rather than 120. Yeah. Like, oh my God, like who's feeding you this shit? Like who, but why do you need to, to, to have 120 grams yeah. of chicken? But I, I, show me the methodology behind this and this, this is like where i'm at in my journey now is why is that being programmed why is that being programmed why do you have to eat that many calories why have you set that macronutrient ratio and when i ask other pts this they're just like just sitting there scratching their canisters thinking, we know we know the answer they've because their coach someone else said so. yeah exactly that that's normally where it goes um so let's before we get sort of go down that mental health tangent um let's get into you as the educator of pts which i find fascinating um yeah tell us what what's going on though i know you've been doing all sorts of things during <laughs> lockdown to launch something um so let's sort of delve into that all right so um <laughs> i've been for the better part of a year been putting together a, a mentorship program for PTs and essentially it's everything that I wish I'd been taught when I first qualified as a PT I did the um, back in the days when you used to actually have to go to a classroom to, to yeah. do your course uh, so I, I did the 12-week um, 
combined PT and sports massage course, which was phenomenal. It was a great course. Then I got my first job in a gym and I was like, people aren't coming to me for personal training. What's this bullshit? And then I was speaking to my fitness manager. He was like, yeah, well, you've got to go out and talk to people. I'm like, what's this about? You're not talking that on the course. You're it, talking no, because like, I've, come, you I've come straight, I've come straight from being a roof tiler, which I wasn't enjoying anymore, to being a PT. And I was like, well, why aren't people coming to me for training? And I was like this close to getting sacked from that job. I quit before I got sacked. <laughs> Quit and I went to Australia. <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, you ain't sacking me, mate. I'm off." <laughs> um, but it taught me a lot. It, it made me realise that when you qualify off these courses, they don't teach you business fundamentals. They don't tell you about business planning. They don't tell you that mainstream gyms need you to sell personal training sessions. They don't tell you this. They tell you whichever provider you go to do this course and you'll be charged 60 pounds an hour straight out the door. Yeah. They, they tend to say, and I had this on mine and the company I use doesn't exist anymore, but they told me that as soon as I came off that course, as soon as I went into fitness first and told them that course, they'd be like, Oh my God, you've done like the best course ever. I went to my first interview, <laughs> mentioned it to the fitness manager and he looked at me and was like, what's that then? And <laughs> I, you know, when you just sink into the chair and I was like, right, that was my whole interview prep gone. <laughs> I literally was thinking, I, I thought I was going to drop their name and he was going to go, oh my God, there's a job. And, he yeah, man, I, 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 and it don't happen like that. And, it's, and I think there's a lot of providers out there now, they're, they're sending kids out into the industry with no life experience. They don't know how, how to relate to, to slightly older people in the gym. They don't have, you know, the... the consultation skills they don't have because i was petrified about asking people for money yeah it's, to, it's to not, hire me as a trainer it's because not i was like is it? oh like you oh, like that so for you to train with me twice a week that's going to be like 800 pound a month yeah like, oh, oh. and i was petrified about asking for money so i did so much study and research into uh consultation techniques into selling into closing into body language and into rapport building and all this kind of stuff and i was like oh my god like why is this not being taught to pts and then i've taken like uh the biochemistry stuff that i've learned and in particular like energy production and once you understand kind of like the flow chart from here is food on a plate yeah. here is energy in your body once you understand that process of actually seeing food to then actually absorbing the nutrients from food, you can understand why people have certain conditions that they have. But you don't need to be a doctor. You just need to understand the processes of the step-by-steps, the, the journey of food to energy. And if any one of those steps is interrupted, once you understand the signs and symptoms associated, then you can say, right, okay, we need to back your training off and we need to get your inflammation down. We need to sort your stress out. And then we can start looking at pounding you metabolically into the gym. Yeah. Whichever way it goes. So getting back to, I, di I do this a lot. I digress and then I come back to the yeah, actual I answer. Think, I, I do a lot of explaining. <laughs> what, you've done then, what you've done then is you've, you've taken me on a, on a journey and understanding. And then I'm, like, I'm thinking as a client, I'm thinking, right, how do I, how do I sign up? I thought it was just going to be train me and eat healthy. And now I'm thinking oh God, I didn't think about information, stress, journey of food, you know, energy production. So as a client, you're thinking, oh my God, now this is worth my money. Yeah. And this is what I'm trying to get personal trainers and particularly newly qualified personal trainers to understand is that, yes, your, your level three PT course will give you the door into the industry. And I always liken it to passing your driving test. Like once you pass your driving test, then you learn how to drive. Mm -hmm. It's the same with your PT course. Once you've passed your level three and you've, you've got into a gym, then you can go, holy shit, I know nothing. And that's what happened to me. The first gym I walked into, there was a, a, a nutrition specialist, there was a hip anatomy specialist, and there was a conditioning a combat fight specialist. Yeah. And I just spent my first six months in there just leeching knowledge off of these three people. 
because they were telling me stuff and I'm just like, oh my God, like, I, I don't know anything. And even now, like, I go on to like, some of Luke's courses, Luke's my mentor, and he would just bombard me with stuff. And I'm like, I thought I was getting somewhere with this and now I realize yeah. there's so much more I don't know. Um, but it's part of the journey, man. It's like, if, if you love what you do, it's never work. And that's the way that I see learning about the body. And that's the way that I see educating personal trainers. For me, it's, it's just something I'm super passionate about. And that's why I start to swear. And that's why I get animated. And that's why I go off on different tangents. And then I will come back to like your original answer. Once I've explained the nuances that feed into, should I eat more carbs or less carbs? Yeah. And th- so I'll explain the variables around it. And then you can make your decision based on the information I've given you. So really, um, I think where we started was um, this sort of course you're bringing out. Is it a course um, or a program? Yeah, so it, yeah, man, it, it's a massive. So I've, I'm basically taking the last 15 years and putting it into a mentorship. So, so you would and qualify as a PT. Um, so any PT in theory could come onto this uh, mentorship, I'm assuming? Yeah, any PT. You don't have to be newly qualified. You, obviously that's more where it's targeted mm-hmm. because it's the stuff that I wish I knew yeah. when, I, when I'd qualified. So that's the main target. But I know PTs that have been in the industry for a long, long, long time. And I talk to them about energy production and they're like, don't know what we're talking about, mate. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I just get my clients to come in. I beat them up for an hour, send them home. Look, man, look, you've, if you've got a successful business and it works for you and your clients are happy and your clients are getting results, fair play. Because not everybody wants to know the ins and outs and the sciences. So and it's open to any personal trainer who wants to upskill themselves. And I've set it out into levels. So like the base level, your foundation level is, it's all like uh, marketing for freelance PTs, marketing for PTs that work in a big box gym. It's how do you go to actually approach somebody who's on the treadmill with noise cancelling headphones and a baseball cap on and how do you engage that person? Mm -hmm. So it's how do you open a conversation? Where do you set your body up? How do you actually then go on to lead that conversation to where you need it to go to get them as a client? So there's a lot of that in level one. I've got level two and three, which are two different things about the body. Uh, so from memory, I think uh, the body part one is all about health markers, uh, gut health, digestion, energy production, that kind of stuff. And then we go into like individual hormones, their roles in the body, what they do, mm-hmm. how um, like signs and symptoms can tell you which of the hormones is out of whack. Yep. So then we go into that and then we go into like, uh, nutritional programming and how to periodize somebody's nutrition how to then look at the body in terms of like joints, muscles, movements, origins, insertions, um, looking at people's range of motions and like why somebody might not be able to take the hand all the way over their head. So what muscles are going to be tight and short for them to not perform a certain movement? Because you're not going to take a guy who's, let's say, 45-year-old office worker, worked in the office for 25 years, you're not going to put them into an overhead squat pattern <laughs> to, say, <laughs> to see if he can move. That is all you've got, to do, is get, <laughs> all you've got to do is get the guy to touch his toes. And chances are he's not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. You've got, with a lot of people we work with, you, you need to start really the fundamentals and a lot of training, especially fresh off the course, want to go in with their... Oh, they, they want to throw everything at them. And I, look, I've been guilty of this myself. Yeah. I, I, the, the first uh, hormone course that I went on I didn't realize they're kind of more of a supplement company. And I was like, yeah, fuck me. Like, I need this supplement. That's it. And I spent like 300 quid on supplements. It wasn't, wasn't Poliquin, was it? Might have been. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say that's the first one that comes to, to mind. Um, so before I, um, we kind of get off this topic, so we touched on, you know, new PTs or any PT throwing in these crazy exercises to a complete beginner. Um, what is the kind of... Um, deciding factor or what do you think is the big difference between what we'd call a good or a successful PT and potentially a shocking PT? Right. I'll give you some examples of a shocking <laughs> open, PT. Open a right? can of worms here for you, mate. Right. So <laughs> uh, when I worked for a, a big chain gym, I used to go and mystery shop 
other gyms, right? So I would go in there on the pretense of being just a regular gym member. I'd go in there, I'd watch every single one of the PTs. And there was a PT and he was working bang in the money center of London. Mm -hmm. He had his client doing a plank on a power plate. He was sat on the power plate next to her, writing some stuff down. I was like, all right, cool. He's not in the most professional of positions, but he's writing some stuff down. I went onto the power plate next to him and he was doodling a banana. <laughs> that to me is a shocking PT. He had a blank piece of paper on a clipboard, his client on a power plate doing a plank, and he's doodling a fucking banana. <laughs> 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 I, I have never seen something that ridiculous ever. Like, honestly, I couldn't believe it. And I, I, I looked at it, I was just like, wow. So like, this is a central London club. Like, this should not be happening. So that's an absolute extreme. I mean, I was not expecting to say that. Uh, well, yeah, <laughs> that's that, well, that's just like one example, man. Like, I've got <laughs> hundreds. But, like, you know, PTs that are texting whilst they're with their client. PTs. Yeah. Uh, I posted one on my uh, coaching for men okay. page the other day. Uh, he was PT, he had a baseball hat on, and he's drinking a cup of coffee while he's with his client warming up on the bench. So he sat his client on a bench, and he stood there, cup of coffee, baseball hat, branded T-shirt, and he's just you know, uh, and he's just looking around the gym. I'm like, you are fucking kidding me. So that yeah. to me is a sh is a shocking PT. I had um, I used to get annoyed when PTs would. PT their client and always be trying to involve other people the whole time. And I get yeah. if someone comes up and says hello and you're like, yep, you're right, you know, just acknowledge because you're a friendly person. But having a conversation with someone, unless it's ridiculously important and you actually apologize to your client and you're, you've got a good rapport with your client, I see it all the time. People chatting, um, well, not now, but I've previously seen it, people chatting while they're training someone and you're thinking, what, what are they paying you for? It's not like, it's literally not a social club. <laughs> yeah. So for me, the complete polar opposite to that, a very, very, very good PT will have a session plan in front of them, whether it's on their mobile phone, whether it's on a tablet, whether it's old school piece of paper, they will have a session plan. They will time their client's rest periods. They will make sure their client is working for every single rep. They would have done a, a movement analysis. They would have done a postural analysis. They would have gone through the foundations before chucking their client into an advanced stage program. You know, a, a, a good, real good quality PT will under, and be able to tell you why they programmed each exercise, why they programmed the amount of sets, why they programmed the amount of reps, why they programmed the amount of reps and the tempo that somebody's performing reps at. A good PT will tell you those five things. If you can't tell me those five things, technically, you might not be a good PT. However, on the flip side of that, if your client retention is good, if your clients are getting results and your clients love you as a trainer, you're still a successful PT. Like You don't have to be a super technical PT. If you're getting your clients results and you care about your clients, then you're a very successful PT in my eyes. Yeah, there's something I wanted to, that I've just thought of that I want to ask you is, where do you think that fine line is between giving a client what they need, so as in a posture analysis or um, a particular movement, for example, and what they want? Because <laughs> clients want, sometimes clients want to feel like they've had a good workout. And you're thinking, well, Potentially, yes, but we're working today on, I don't know, a, you know, a technical element of your training that's going to help you in the long term. But they're going to be like, well, I just want to be beasted for an hour. It, where's that fine line? And do you just go, do you know what, I'm going to give you what you need? Or do you go, do I give you what you want? Or you, do you try and find a happy medium? So this for me starts in the consultation process. Mm -hmm. In your consultation with your client, as a PT, you have to remember that you are the professional. They've come to you, your expertise, your guidance, your help. So you're the one that's in charge of setting their behavior expectations. So I would say you have to have a plan. You have to know what type of sessions you're going to do with your client in the beginning. If you've been working with your client for a few months and you've both got a good rapport, 
your client comes in and they say, I've just been smashed at work all day long. I'm so wound up. I'm so frustrated. Then it might be time to put the weights away and get the boxing pads out and just yeah. let them just bash the shit out of something and just let them de-stress in that sense. On the other side of that, and I had a client, <laughs> I had a client do this and this was in Croydon. And I got some funny looks about this one. Um, my client had a battering of a day at work. And all I did was lay her down for an hour and teach her how to breathe properly and how to actually use her diaphragm and actually release the diaphragm a little bit. And I did some manual manipulation through the costals and that kind of thing, which you need the technical knowledge to know how to do it. As far as I'm concerned, if your client leaves you feeling better than when they walked in, you've done your job. I think with that person as well, um, I've done different things like that in the past. And you come out sometimes, you go, that was a waste of time. Like I did um, uh, yoga in a gothic cellar in Prague, very random. My, my missus got it for my birthday. And I'm useless, mate. They're putting like all these like, <laughs> herbal, they're putting herbal drops on our hands. We had to take yeah, all yeah. the breaths in and talking about, you know, the third eye. And anyway, you kind of leave and you think, oh, I don't know about that. It's a bit of a waste of time, waste of money. We didn't really do much. But a year later, I'm still going, oh, that was actually pretty cool. Like, I actually wanted it's, to go do that. It's in your head, right? So, so that, it's in your head. And, and the, the, so you did. Yeah. yeah, man. So this is where that link to like that physical exertion, as well as being kind to yourself and being kind to your client, there is a fine line. And this is where what I, uh, and I, I kind of borrowed this from Mark Coles, is that coach's eye. There's over time, and when you've done thousands and thousands and thousands of sessions, you can look at somebody's body language you can, and you can say, do you know what? They're not good for a, let's say I've got somebody programmed for a big hypertrophy day. Yeah. Like my hypertrophy sessions, I've had the most mild mannered people and shy people scream and swear yeah like they've never screamed and sworn before and they said oh i can't believe i've done that and that's training that's hard right if i if i've got that session program but they've come into me and they're like oh my god i'm battered I'm yeah. like, you know what let's just let's just back it off for today we'll do some weights but we'll back it off because metabolically and mentally you can't put that effort in it's just physically impossible. You're just not going to do it. I'm, I'm glad you. I'm glad you agree with uh, <laughs> how how I've always seen it. Because I sometimes I, you know, with especially something like a squat or a technical move, I'm like, we need to work on this. But also, it's going to take the best part of the session. And as much as you want to improve your squat, your main goal is to I don't know get fitter or get healthier or feel better. And you know, you're not competing at a high level in, for example, powerlifting. The squat was a side goal. So let's just today let's teach you a little bit but then we're going to make sure after a bit of squatting we're going to give you a proper workout <laughs> so you leave right, it, it, yeah man like, you, you've, you've just touched on something there which i think a lot of trainers forget is your training like general population is probably 98 percent of your client base you're not training fucking usain bolt mm. you're not training olympic level athletes you're not training professional level athletes so you don't have to be on that point all the time plus a professional athlete has recovery time they're not working a nine to five or they're not working from seven in the morning to seven at night so yeah there's a lot of intuition that you need as a pt and i think there's a lot of pts that are frightened to to do that wound down sort of session because they think oh the perception of a pt is that kind of sergeant major you know i'm going to smash you into next week and when you start looking at stress and hormone balance it ain't good to keep people in that beast mode fight or flight mode all the time because you don't process food you don't absorb nutrients from food you fire the brain up so that somebody's not sleeping and if you've got somebody who's already come to you because they're overweight, if they're overweight, they're inflamed. It's just a given. If they're inflamed, they're going to be in a pain already. So then you're going to smash them in a workout. You're going to give them more pain in terms of DOMS. And then they're going to be like, oh, I don't know if I actually want to go back to that session because they're going to kill me again. 
And that's when you start to get clients to lose their adherence. And that's where some trainers are like, well, this industry is shit because I've given them a beating. They've not come back. But because trainers don't understand the metabolism and, and the hormone balance behind somebody's mood or somebody's energy level, they're just like, well, this is the session I've got planned. We have to do it. If they even have a session plan. Yeah, I'm, I must admit, I made the mistake once with a, when I first started PTing, I did a couple of sessions with a lady and she was like, oh, I don't really think it's doing much. I'm not sore. Uh, I want my, my arms, I want to work them more. So me being the PT thought, oh, let's throw everything in. Let's throw it all in. <laughs> yeah, I never saw her again. She went to A&E uh, that oh, next, days oh. later because she had DOMS. She had such bad DOMS in her arm that she then went to A&E because her arms oh, were too sore. And you know, you know when you're thinking, you asked for it and I gave it to you. And then since then you think, no, nah, that one, that, 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 that's her dictating the session. That's not how it should be done. But you only make these mistakes once. Yes, you do. Well, you, you would hope so anyway. <laughs> yeah. um, what, what's your sort of typical client then at the moment? And what's your sort of main client that you, you tend to so attract? So I've, I've started to make the shift now into men's health and in particular, men's hormone balance, men's mental health, and shedding the stigma of men actually talking about bodily functions. So <laughs> that is my, that is, that's my client base at the moment. So one of the first questions my guys get on their, you know, after we've gone through the goal setting phase on my consultation is, right, how often are you shitting? It's the first question. Because if I know how often they're, they're actually going to the toilet, I know what sort of state their digestion's in. Yeah, you're looking for red I know flags. What, yeah. I'm looking for red flags everywhere. Yeah. So based on the questions that I ask them, depending on their answer, it will tell me, right, okay, there's potentially low stomach acid, there's potentially low thyroid, there's potentially um, gut upset or leaky gut, there's potentially pre-diabetes, there's potentially type 2 that's undiagnosed. All these different things are what I'm working for guys with now. So I'm looking at blood pressure, I'm looking at um, erectile dysfunction, I'm looking at uh, testosterone estrogen balances, I'm looking at uh, massively insulin resistance. Because yeah, insulin resistance is huge for men. The, the, the amount of type 2 diabetes in men at the minute is going up and up and up and up and up. And that also feeds other diseases. And it's bad news. If that starts getting out of control, if you don't get it in line quick enough, you're just shooting yourself into an early grave. And it ain't good. Yeah, no. So are these, um, these are all important things that are normally overlooked. And is this done mainly via a questionnaire? Then obviously, the one about how many times you shit is obviously a questionnaire. Um, yes. You know, things <laughs> like the diabetes, you send people for blood tests, or is it just you kind of just asking them questions to, like I said, give you some sort of red flags to then send them the further? Right, so, so my entry process for actually becoming a client with me is quite extensive. If they're not willing to use a blood glucose monitor, if they're yeah. not willing to go and get labs done, if they're not willing to actually open up and talk about health, then they're not ready for my style of program. Yeah. And that's not a reflection on them it's because they're mentally not ready to open up so i do a lot in terms of like the actual psychology of change mm -hmm. and they fill out my readiness to claim uh, readiness to change questionnaire and if they're scoring low on that form they're not going to stick to my program so i don't see the point in taking their money it's just not fair yeah. right um, so they're not going to actually adhere to any of it Exactly. And for me, I, I care about my client results and I probably care more than them in some cases. Yeah. And it's, it's an intense program because I will have, like, I will have men cry on me like, when I do a Skype consult or a Zoom consult or whatever. But like, they will break down and cry on me because I would just strip away excuse after excuse after excuse and I will get down to the core reason. And once I find that core reason, bang, that's it. Like they're a client for life yeah, all because they want to go on that journey. And the amount of men that I'm finding that have suppressed a lot of their own feelings and they've suppressed a lot of their own desires yeah. through fear of rocking the boat and through fear of upsetting their partner is massive. 
it's one of those things that it needs addressing. Like men's mental health is is huge, and like the, the rates of male suicide at the minute are just fucking off the charts, and it's bad. And it's because I, and this is just my opinion. Um, I think men are a little bit lost at the minute. We've gone through that phase where you know the man's supposed to be dominant. Yeah, we've go. Phase, right we've gone. Yeah, we've gone through a phase of men are supposed to be the sensitive guy that does all these great big grand romantic gestures. We're going through a phase of female empowerment at the minute, which is amazing and it's incredible. Like that fight for quality is it should be done, but now it's. it's no. Nope. No, if. I should be a dominant man. I don't know if I should be the romantic nice guy. I don't know if, if I should be doing this for myself. I don't know if I should be looking after my partner more. Like, so I think men are a little bit lost and that stress is feeding a lot of anxiety. It's feeding a lot of depression. And it's, a, it's just a vicious cycle that until yeah. you find a coach that can, can break it, it's hard. I haven't really thought about it like that before, but you know, even with everything going on, like you said, with um, female empowerment and even, you know, things like um, now you've got the big sort of pride movement. You know, I've got mates who are, I've got plenty of mates actually who are, who are gay and mates who are bisexual. And, you know, like you said before, it was all about right man, dominant, right caveman. Um, and now we, I don't, you don't really know where to, to, to put ourselves, you know, we're, are we feminine? Are we, yeah. Are we well, obviously we've obviously all we're we're respectful to everyone and um but yeah it's hard to now you you feel bad if we're going oh that's a manly thing to do or that's a feminine thing to do and i see what you mean it's a very fine and, line and, and, and those lines of, of what's acceptable before you offend somebody are getting more and more and more blurred and but it's a simple way like women don't know what to say men don't know what to say for right or wrong and it's just yeah, it all fit like when that when you have that confusion and that anxiety in your head, it will manifest itself in your body. It it's going to happen. Whether it's in like tension in your shoulders, whether it's in an upset stomach, whether it's in appetite suppression, whether it's an appetite increase. Yeah, because stress and appetite are so tightly linked, it's unbelievable. Yeah, which are you? Because I, I talk to my friends about this. When when you get anxious and stressed, are you a, an eater or a a, a faster? Because you tend to be one or the other, don't you? For me, I, I've I've got a sweet tooth. You're like me. So, so, so for me, it's where's the chocolate, mm. and so that's generally my go-to. If if I can find a bit of chocolate somewhere, mm. I would generally tend to feel better off that. But so, then I will have that feeling of guilt, like, yeah. oh, man, like what, why did you eat that? You didn't need it. So All you need to do is go away and stretch and meditate. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, I was going to say, what, what techniques do you use then um, with your uh, male clients with regards to sort of mental health? Obviously, you find what they're, I'm guessing, what motivates them um, internally. That's the first sort of thing you do. And then what sort of tips or tricks do you have to keep them on the straight and narrow and make sure they don't slip off with anxiety or... Um, stress and become inflamed and binge and all that sort of stuff. That's the million dollar question, isn't it? Is where yeah. to start? Well, yeah. Um, well, so, in, in summary, <laughs> there any, yeah, always right, any so, tricks that you've used that any little tricks that you think you know what that's actually quite quite a good one. Right. So the the thing for me is I I like to make what I call like the hippie fairy stuff manly, right? So rather than just say to somebody, "Oh, go away and meditate." So, right, what I want to do is I want to go away, just find a little bit of headspace, just go, go out for yourself. And all I want to do is just sit down, chill out, and just relive just a really good memory. But I only want you to breathe through your nose. All I want you to do, just for five minutes, that's all I need you to do. Whenever you're feeling that anxiety coming on, that's all I need you to do. Whether you go to the driving range, whether you go and play golf, whether you go skeet shooting whether you go sailing whether you go rowing whatever your hobbies are go and engage in your hobby and put yourself first because there's a lot of men that will put their kids first they will put their partners first they will put their work first they won't ever put themselves first because that could be deemed as selfish and they don't want to be branded selfish 
So for me, my, my go-to is... On. This is perfect. Sorry, just to butt in there. I've had this the last three weeks. I've been a very anxious on an edge the last three weeks and a little bit lost. And I suddenly realised today, I don't know why it rang me today, um, maybe because I knew we were talking about it, that I was like, it's almost that I haven't done anything for myself. So I've lost that kind of purpose. And as soon as I was like, oh my God, I've got a photo shoot in four weeks, right? I need to home in on that and start doing things for me and start telling people, no, I can't do that or, I, or I'm eating that or I'm going to be there at that time. I suddenly felt like a weight had been lifted off me, almost like I was back in control of my life. It's huge, um, man. I'll tell you, one of the big things, right, so to answer your question, one of the big things I teach my guys is the power of saying no. Mm. It's enormous. When you can say to somebody, no, I'm not going to do that, because and then you give your reasons people are generally quite accepting of that mm. yeah you, you rather, rather than down, saying man. yeah so rather than saying oh yeah i'll do that and then resenting saying yes just say no give your reasons and then do what you need to do for yourself it's a huge step to take and it's we've got a cultural thing a, about us as being British as well, the, the whole stiff upper lippedness and yeah. Yeah, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, it'll be fine. Yeah, we'll, we'll just carry on. But like, we're not good at saying no. And when somebody does say no to you, it's like, oh, oh, okay, fair enough. But as long as you give a reason, it's fine. Like, it's, it's not a big, not a big deal. Yeah, I like that. that's, that's a big, big hurdle that people, I find once they get over, the rest tends to be fairly smooth sailing. Yeah, it links back to what you said. It's about being almost being a little bit selfish. By saying no, you you are taking control of that situation. Otherwise, you become like a, I mean, back in the day when I was at uni, it was all about being the yes man. There was I think there was a book called The Yes Man, and it was all yeah, about yeah, Danny Wallace, everyone. great book. Yeah, I haven't actually read it, but that kind of mentality of you know you you should be saying yes to enjoy yourself, and you get to a point where. Yeah, you say yes to too much. Like you said, that there's no, there's no you time anymore and you don't take time to meditate. I mean, I can't say I've done that because I didn't know what meditating was until you told me about five minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> That's weird. Uh, now, here's the thing, right? when you're looking at meditation, there's so many different types of meditation and meditation has moved on from that perception of, you know, you've got to sit in that lotus pose and you need to empty your mind of all um, Yeah, like, <laughs> let's face it, for the majority of people, even when you hear a sound, it puts a word in your head because you've interpreted the sound in your conscious brain. So I personally find that a guided meditation is much, much better. So the Headspace app is incredible because that guy, like if you his voice is very, very calm. He's very very good at making you settle down but he's very good at taking meditation into the 21st century what's it called headspace so, so it's an app you download on the phone you get 10 10 minute sessions for free and then you sign up to whichever program suits you okay it's brilliant absolutely brilliant if you need a bit of headspace and a bit of downtime i'd highly recommend it highly recommend it and it's not something that men tend to talk about like you said it's not something no, we, we we tend to associate it with uh like you said hippies or um I mean, it's acceptable for a female to do it as it, it that's what the stigma associated and if we do it we're seen as like you said soft or uh, yeah and so this is nothing i'm working on now is that perception or that difference between it's okay for women to do it but it's not okay for men to do it the big one i'm facing with that at the minute is testosterone replacement therapy okay so there's a lot of guys that don't know they're testosterone deficient. And the signs and symptoms of depression are so tightly linked to every single sign and symptom of low testosterone that a lot of guys are actually being misdiagnosed and they're being given SSRIs, uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, antidepressants basically yeah when what they should be doing is looking at lifestyle modifications to stop driving a stress-based pathway and start driving a testosterone producing pathway or even better than that actually start using testosterone as a legitimate replacement because your levels are so low you know when a woman goes through the menopause no one thinks twice when she says, oh, I'm going to go on estrogen replacement. 
because it's the dumb thing. But as men age, and it's happening earlier and earlier and earlier, your testosterone levels, they're going through the floor. It's inevitable, it's gonna happen. So the only hormone in your body that goes up as you age is stress. Everything else is gonna start taking a nosedive. So yeah, you've got to start they, In other countries, is it in America, they, they actually provide um, testosterone replacement as a, you know, as a sort of mainstream therapy, but I don't really think you hear about it much in, in the UK, do you? It's not really, like you said, it's not really talked about much. You know what? It's still stigmatized in the US because the perception when you say to somebody, oh, I'm going to take testosterone, is straight away they start thinking bodybuilder. Yeah. They start thinking roid rage, bodybuilder, oh my God, why are you taking us testosterone? What people don't realize is that testosterone in the right doses can massively increase your health, Unbel like exponentially improve your health. It can improve your mood, it can improve your sexual function, it can improve um, digestion, it can improve, it's actually uh, been shown to be cardio protective. Okay. So one of the reasons that people um, were reluctant to prescribe it is because they assumed that because all these bodybuilders were having heart attacks in their 50s, yeah. that, oh, it's the steroids, it's the testosterone, it's messing their heart up. It's not. Is it in the right doses, which are not what they call super physiological doses the bodybuilders will take in healthy doses it's very cardio protective it's very neural protective it's very much a, a substance that your body needs mm -hmm. and this is something i'm talking about with a lot of guys at the minute is things like erectile dysfunction i'm trying yeah. to get as many guys as i can now away from porn because it's not it's not good it's really not good. If you're sharing porn with a partner, it's different. But if you're just sitting there every night whacking away to porn, you're, you're feeding that addictive, negative behavior pattern. And you're also then feeding a set of expectations for what sex is going to be like when you actually get some or when you're allowed some after, you know, this, if you're allowed to mix with households yet, I don't yeah. know. Um, so there's a whole set of psychological ramifications of being addicted to porn. Yeah, what's, what's the negative side, what's the negative then of someone, of someone looking at porn, apart from obviously they're gonna be highly disappointed when their partner doesn't do some sort of weird backflip and... <laughs> <laughs> so that's right, so number one is there's um, a self-esteem issue for, for guys, is my knob's not as big as that guy's on the screen mm -hmm. and I'm not producing loads like that guy is. <laughs> Right? And it's legit, right? You, you laugh about it, but this is the stigma that I want to break now. Yeah. Is, yeah, it's a legit thing and it's a legit illness. You don't laugh at someone because they're addicted to gambling or drugs or alcohol, whatever. That addiction to porn, it feeds a, a kind of neurosis that, oh man, like my cock's not as big as that. I don't shoot loads as big as that. Whenever I hook up with a girl, she doesn't want to come on her face. Like she doesn't want me to do her in the ass. That's like, what I was thinking when oh, I said like, that. What the fuck? Yeah, so like your expectations of what a female should be enjoying are totally different. Massively skewed. I mean, I don't know. I, I used to train um, a couple of porn stars, actually, believe it or not. So I used to know a hell of a lot about the industry, and it changed my perception because I felt. Um, not really sorry for the girls, um, but they'd had a troubled um, upbringing, uh, most of them, and they were doing it purely for business. So it was just purely as a job that was well paid. There was no, and that was it. And they kind of almost liked to be that outcast because they had been brought up in the kind of a troubled um, family and they was kind of been brought up in as kind of like an outcast and they were doing porn as so normal people thought they were, you know, scumbags. And when I got to know them after a couple of years, they are the nicest people and they are very, very clued up and very switched on. And for them, it is just purely business. That is my job. We, we yeah. go and train people. They go and <laughs> take That's it. That people. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so but when it comes around into men's health, that's where like, things like performance anxiety can start to come into play. So you're, you're feeding, you're, 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 re, you're starting a hypothetical, non-existent, stressful scenario in your mind, and that will manifest in your knob when it doesn't work. And once it doesn't work once, 
then you're like, oh, fuck me. Like, I don't want to try this again because I can't get it up. But as soon as you start to redress that, the, the mindset around expectations of sex, it's totally different. Porn's never going to go away. It's here to stay. It is what it is. But one of the big things, and, that, and this is how in-depth I get with some of my guys, is you know, how much porn do you watch? How many times a week are you, are you knocking one out? Or how many times a week are you actually having sex with your partner? Mate, they need to. They need to do. Literally, I was. I think I was quite lucky, really, because I got to meet the got to meet these girls, and they were telling me about how it is in the industry for the men, and, the, and you, you kind of look at it in a different way now. Look at it as a. Did, did they? Um, did they tell you how many drugs the guys were on to make them keep keep performing? No, they. It was weird. I had some girls messaging me trying to get me involved, and the girls I knew were just like, "Don't even entertain it because it, it it's well, it's badly paid, and you know, it's just a bit." a bit strange as a as a profession and that's how they see it and the same with the girls you know they do the cool girl stuff it is literally just yeah. a profession um so when you kind of see it it's no different to maybe doing a <laughs> as weird as it sounds like a zoom call with a client it's just a different topic and a <laughs> so it's very very weird um i've completely lost track of what we're doing because i managed to lose the screen in the middle of that and then we we're talking about porn for about 10 minutes um <laughs> Um, I don't even know how we got onto that. Hormones, hormones. Um, so I was going to ask you, people listening to this, uh, or mainly guys, um, how would you recommend they get their testosterone levels tested if they're potentially, you know, a little bit depressed or down? And what are they looking for? And then what kind of advice going forward if it is low? Um, is there any creams or gels or have they got to inject or is it NHS or private? I mean, what, what, where are we going with this? What, what's your advice? Uh, I, okay, so a big issue that we've got in the UK is we don't have a lot of investigative type medicine. So you go to the doctor, you present signs and symptoms of low testosterone. They are very similar, close to identical to low or to having depression. So your doctor's going to run through a checklist in their head and say, okay, depressed, no energy, um, no libido just no get up and go, probably a little bit iron deficient, potentially a little bit B12 deficient, probably a bit depressed. We'll give them a low dose of sertraline, job done. What they've not investigated is, are they losing their hair? Are they gaining hair where they don't want hair? Are they just not interested in women at all? Are they lethargic? Are they losing strength? Are they losing muscle tissue? Are they actually, are their gym sessions just going down and down and down? If you like, if you regularly bench pressed, I'm just going to use 100 kilos because it's a nice round number. If you've regularly bench pressed 100 kilos for 10 reps, your whole training life, and all of a sudden you'll get into like nine reps and then eight reps and then six reps. If you've not changed anything else, that's probably your testosterone starting to get lower. Probably. I'm not saying it is, but it's a possible sign. So what you're going to have to do is convince your GP in this country that I would like my testosterone checked. And you have to ask them for your free testosterone, your SHGB, your HCG, your uh, what's the other one? total test. Yeah. So those are the big four that you need your doctor to test. Thyroid will also be a good one to test as well because without thyroid, there's not a lot of movement internally for stuff. So a lot of production gets slowed down when your thyroid isn't functioning. So you definitely want to go to your doctor, present every single sign and symptom that you've got low testosterone. Ask them for those tests. It might be difficult to do by the NHS. So you may need to look at uh, going to a private doctor or a functional medicine doctor which do a Google search, functional medicine doctor near me, you'll find one, they will do a bit more investigation type work. If you've been diagnosed with uh, suboptimal testosterone levels, then like you said, there are creams available, there are gels available, there are actually um, sublingual dissolvable pills that you can take, so they just go under your tongue and they just dissolve. Yep. Um, but from the research I've read, the best, most effective way to do it is uh, with the injection. Yeah. Uh, 
depending on what type of testosterone you get prescribed, whether it's a water-based or an oil-based, that will dictate whether you inject straight into the muscle or whether you inject into the fat layer. But that's a different subject for a different time. So from what I've read and from what I've seen and from the, the study that I've done, injecting is the most effective way, but there are some very, very good transdermal creams that you just rub over your balls yeah. and then away you go. You literally rub them direct. Rub them direct, straight onto the sack. Bloody hell. Well, you know, think about it, right? So, so where do where you produce day. most of your testosterone? It's in your nuts. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Well, let me, if I'm going to do transdermal, like through the skin, put it where you produce testosterone. But it's also not convenient if like, you want to go swimming or whatever. If you go swimming, you've then got to reapply it. So there's issues with that kind of thing like from a practicality point of view. Mm -hmm. But that will be down to you and your physician to, to sort out. Makes sense. Makes sense. So um, obviously we've touched on uh, the, the mindset of you know, your male clients and making sure they're... Adherent and uh, you know how important things like hormones are. Um, earlier on, I know you mentioned the importance of gut health, and the only reason I've just I wrote that down is because I've heard about four or five people this week talk about IBS, gut health, you know, and which foods and which diet they're going to go on. And I've, I, I mean, I've heard it a lot in the past few years, but for some reason this week or the last couple of weeks, I've heard loads of people going for intolerance tests. Um, so. I don't know, can you touch on the importance of gut health? And right, okay. So the first big thing to realize about the gut is that is where 60 to 80% of your immune system sits. So if your gut health is compromised, so is your immune system. If your immune system is down, then you're open and susceptible to a lot more disease and just things going wrong inside the body. IBS is not really a diagnosis. It's so IBS is irritable bowel syndrome. Pissed off belly. <laughs> the belly belly, the Pharaoh's revenge, whatever you want to call it, Bangalore belly, you name it. It's that syndrome is a it's a whole collection of signs and symptoms. Uh, so if you think about like inception, where it's a dream inside a dream inside a dream inside a dream, that is a syndrome. It's a set of symptoms inside a set of symptoms that are feeding another set of symptoms. So to actually pinpoint exactly what is wrong with the gut, it's hard to say because sometimes, so this is where like not only the frequency of your poop is important, but yeah. the quality of your poop is important as well. How many times should we be pooping? Uh, at, it should be at, at least once a day. And what you're looking for is a nice, you know, formed log kind of shape. It shouldn't smell too bad. It should be earthy in its color. And it shouldn't hurt you to, to pass it. Like, it shouldn't feel like you're pushing out a fucking 10 pound brick out of your ass. Like, it well, shouldn't like, feel like that. The Play Doh machines. <laughs> yeah, you shouldn't be, yeah, it shouldn't feel like forceful. But on the flip side of that, it also shouldn't be coming out just like liquid. Or pebble dashing everywhere. Or pebble dashing. If you're <laughs> pebble dashing, then yeah, you've got some issues going on somewhere. <laughs> Listen, your, your title for this video is going to be cool, man. Porn and pebble dashing. <laughs> Mate, I'm going to just extract bits about, there was a line you said earlier about how uh, you're, you're not as big as the other guys. <laughs> uh, uh, right, so, so getting back to the gut, getting back to the gut. Yeah. Um, for me, it starts in the stomach, right? So if you follow the journey of food, that will generally tell you where there's gut issues. If you're seeing still like big pieces of food, in the bowl after you've shipped, then your stomach acid is not breaking down food properly. If your stomach acid is not breaking down food properly, that could be a thyroid issue, it could be a stress issue, um, it could be a problem with your pepsinogen, which actually activates all your hydrochloric acid. Moving on from there, if your pancreas is not chucking out insulin, you're going to struggle to get the glucose into the cells. If you're on a, if you or historically, if you've been on a low fat diet and your gallbladder is not chucking out bile, and if you notice that like, after you eat like fish or avocado or something like fatty, if you notice there's like a little film on the water or on the bowl, 
Mm. That means you're not absorbing fat. If you're not absorbing fat, then it means your cellular walls are not going to be holding their integrity very well. So you're not going to be getting nutrients in and out of that cell. If you can't get nutrients in and out of a cell, that leads on to other disease and dysfunction. With me so far, because I'm going really quick. <laughs> no, it, it, you know, if you're not absorbing, you know, the the nutrients that you're actually taking in, there's going to be a hell of a lot of um, issues going forward, aren't there? Oh, really? massive. You know, massive. in a nutshell, I suppose. Yeah, and then when you move into the the, the small intestine, like, so you know, that the, so the small intestine's a tube, right? Mm -hmm. Inside that tube, there's like little fingers that kind of hang down, yeah. and on those fingers are little hooks, and those little hooks are what actually grab onto the nutrients pull it through the, the gut wall and your gut wall actually has like gaps in it but in between these gaps there's like what you call like tight junctions and they should only allow food to go through one way yeah people with ibs what tends to happen is they're usually in a highly stressed state anyway and that stress and that inflammation actually degrades the cell wall so what happens then is that tight junction rather than being a really small gap is now a really big gap and then food actually passes through that gap. Yeah. As the food passes through, let's say you've eaten a piece of chicken, you've not chewed it properly, that's got into your small intestine, it's been broken down into its like still quite big protein size, and it's not been broken right down to its amino acid size. What happens then is that chicken protein is in your bloodstream, your white blood cells will see it and go, you're a foreign yeah. protein, okay. bang, like, we'll attack it, and that again flashes up your inflammation response. And if that keeps happening and keeps happening and keeps happening, the next time you eat chicken, your white blood cells are yeah. already primed to attack it. Is this, so this is, is why you can get the shits as soon as you eat something. Does this link into that kind of leaky gut? You know, that that's it. So that yeah. gap in the in the gut wall that is leaky gut because it's not being controlled by the tight junction. So it's just leaking through. Yeah, no, that's um, always been pretty serious. I know um, there was a few years ago, everyone was going about gut health and it was all about leaky gut, leaky gut. But yeah, recently, like I said, it's all been about people throwing around IBS again, which it clearly isn't. But I know, as you just said, it, it often stems from something not potentially you've eaten right now. It can be, it's a, it's a, a you know, over a prolonged period of time, um, which can then get, um, exacerbated by stress I guess because I know it's I don't know if you know it's when you're more relaxed even I've said this when I've had sometimes I eat crap food or have a couple of drinks my stomach is better I don't think it's from the choice of food I think it's because I'm in a state of you know I'm I'm chilled <laughs> I'm relaxed because you're, you're in that rest and digest state and th this is a big uh, thing I educate my clients on you you have your fight and flight beast mode state and you have your rest and digest state Mm -hmm. when you're at work when you're in that beast mode i've got to get this done i've got to get this done when the kids are on your case when you've got jobs to do when you know that you've got to sleep and like bang 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 bang, bang you're just on the go on the go on the go on the go the message that your body receives is that you're being chased by a tiger or yeah. you're you're being hunted down or you're gearing up for a fight so your body's then going to divert all the blood and all the nutrients away from all of your digestive organs into your legs, into your arms, up to your eyes, up to your brain to gear you up for a survival type situation. How are you going to absorb nutrients if you're in that state? Mm -hmm. You're not because your stomach acid, like your body doesn't give a fuck if you're horny, your body doesn't give a fuck if you're hungry. If you're stressed, your body's priority is to survive. And that will override every other system in the body that makes sense that's been every other system that's put simpler than i think anyone's ever put it before so that you know that makes that's my goal makes... is take take the ridiculously complicated biochemistry me metabolism and all that shit and make it really easy to understand <laughs> no i mean it works and i think um we'll, we'll probably leave it there for the you know the the sort of um the clever you know anatomy the, the technical bit. Um, and i want to touch on obviously mindset i think to finish off but i think we we'll definitely and you know if you're free at some point i have to get you back on for maybe we'll just delve into a particular area whether it is yeah man we'll, we'll, we'll pick one subject and we'll uh we'll, we'll get into it i think that's what we might have to do because we've touched on so many things um so many different things that i think you know we'll choose a 
a particular area and we'll, we'll get some questions on that. So I know you're really hot on that kind of mindset, as you said, um, you know, and changing how especially guys are thinking about their life and training. Um, so what kind of things are you doing with your clients and how are you getting them to sort of stay motivated and driven to their, to their goals, I suppose? Priorities. It's find out what somebody wants and then find out why they want it. If I know, do, let's say I have a hypothetical client comes to me, says, I want to lose four stone because I'm going to a wedding in six months. Brilliant. Like I know exactly what we need to do. I can reverse engineer your program back from there. You can see the clear path. Good. When somebody comes to me and they say, oh, I just want to lose a bit of weight, straight away that's an alarm bell to me because they're telling me a goal, but they're not telling me why. All right, okay, brilliant. So then I will make it a specific thing. Okay, how much weight do you want to lose? Have you got a set amount you want to lose or is there a certain weight that you want your body to be? Depending on their answer, we'll dictate my next set of questions. And from there, it will be, a, I, like, so this is where like, my clients get really emotional on me, <laughs> is I will say, I, so I will have them rank each one of their goals on its level of importance to them, how motivated they are to achieve that goal on a scale of one to 10, how confident they feel that they can achieve it, and then how committed they are to achieving that goal. But what I will do is I will have them write their own definition for each one of those. So what does importance mean to you? What does motivation mean to you? If you had to write a dictionary definition for confidence, what would you say it is? Do the same for commitment. So I have them create their own definitions for what each of those things are. That's really important. Um, it's easy, isn't it? Oh, it's huge. I mean, I, you're going to say how much about you? Know, I've got your 10. But, but, but I'm not actually thinking. I'm just, just circling. Yeah. And the thing is, like, people don't, people will give you the answer that they think you want. Yeah. And so when somebody says to me, you know, oh, it's seven or an eight, I love it when they're honest because then I can say to them, okay, that's amazing. Like you, you, you know, you've got a good degree of confidence, but what's stopping you being a hundred percent confident? What's stopping you being 10 out of 10 confident? And that's when it opens up for me, the whole mindset of do they have a fear of failing? Do they have a fear of success? Do they have a fear of what other people are going to perceive them as? Are they going to be um, self-sabotaging because subconsciously they're not actually ready to have a physique that they want? So all these things feed into a mindset and it feeds into somebody's energy. And as soon as I get into that reasoning, that's when the emotions start pouring out. Because I won't let them give me an incomplete answer. They have to give me a reason. And this is like, I've had people walk out of consultations with me because they're like, this is too much. Yeah, but you, I didn't, I, 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 I didn't come here for it. Yeah, and people will say to it, so they will message me later on and they'll say, look, I'm sorry about that, but I didn't come here for a therapy session. I was like, well, tough shit. If you want to change your body, it's because you're not happy with something, which means there's something that's driving you to get from your state of current pain that wants to drive you to a state of pleasure. You don't necessarily know what that state of pleasure is yet, but that's my job to help fill in that gap. So when it comes to mentality, there's a huge, I mean, like people make their entire living out of this. I have a friend, she's a life coach. She's been doing it for a long time. She's very, very successful. And this is all she does is get people from that state of pain to that state of pleasure by whichever means that she, as the expert, will, will see fit. So that, that, to me, is mindset. And it's so important because the body will not go where the mind blocks it. And it's not, so it's not the case of, as we said earlier, going, well, how bad do you want it? 10 out of 10? Well, you've got to work harder than eat less. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the bro science. That's, this leads to being... We, we've done all the, all, the, all the important bits are over and I've just realised why the video is still going. It's because there's two of us. 
so there's no limit to the video. Ah, oh, we like it. I was thinking, <laughs> this is obviously going really quick. So, in the bin section, there is no oh, Chris, mate. Mate, my usual co host. So, you can go first. I've, what do you hate? I've already mentioned one, which is my Instagram for fitness twats, the scammers. So, there's the, that was my one, but I mentioned that earlier. So, for me, <laughs> It's not their drivers that don't indicate. I don't know why, but when I get to a roundabout and there's somebody in the left-hand lane that I'm looking at, if they don't indicate to go left and they keep coming round, the expletives that get thrown at that person are unbelievable. So if you see me out in my car, make sure you indicate or I'm going to swear at you from behind my safety net. <laughs> so they are people that are in the... Are they, they're not turning in front of you, though, are they? They're turning... So, well, it's, yeah, so it's just people that don't indicate in general. In general, <laughs> I, I don't know why it just it just fucking winds me up. It really does. What, what about cyclists? Because <laughs> they they some of them don't like to indicate, do they? Oh no, they're in the same boat. If you're just not indicating full stop, like you're a dick. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Use your fucking ender. How hard? Like literally, all you got to do is this: tap the fucking lever. Just indicate. <laughs> I'm one of those idiots that um, I'll even indicate when there's no one around. And, uh, oh, see, I've, I've got no beef with that. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just feel, I always just don't know. I feel like when I'm walking and a car like pulls in front of me, doesn't indicate, or I'm waiting at a crossing and they, you know, and they're, I'm waiting to go straight on and they're coming left or something. And I could have walked. I'm like, if you'd indicated, like, <laughs> I could have walked and you've now cost me 10 seconds of my day. <laughs> Yeah, so people that don't indicate can go in my bin. I like, mate, I like that one. I like that one. Um, I'm going to have to... Uh, I was gonna, I'll, I'll, give, I'll, give you, I'll give you two as well then. So the first one is linked to yours, which is... Um, I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, someone called an arsehole. So it's, it, it, it's... It's not an arsehole. It's an arsehole. So it's in a gym, someone who asks a question, not wanting... Ah, to yes. I have had any for a while <laughs> but at one of my old gyms it is always people that would ask, oh well how, how do I build my chest and you tell them and they go like or either they go no or they would just go okay and then go back to exactly what they were doing show me the money motherfucker that's how you that's how you build a chest <laughs> uh, but yeah I used to have a few of them all the time but no, <laughs> I, I think I'm gonna go I'm gonna go down the route uh, I'm going to do it because Chris isn't here because he loves this programme, I think, so he can't defend it. Uh, I, I don't know if you love it, but Love Island. Oh, I'm with you on that. Put it in the fucking bin. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I, I like... I, I, try, I tried watching it one time. Yes. And I got 10 minutes into it and I thought, what a load of shit. Do you I, know what? No. There's the reason I've got... A... <laughs> The concept I quite like, yeah. What I don't like is the fact that I've watched, um, I think it's X on the Beach, and they condense, I don't know, a day into half an hour. And in half an hour, you've got a whole day of arguments, fights, sex, people getting drunk, more arguments. They basically get them smashed and then they will argue in half an hour show. Quite entertaining. But Love Island, half an hour in, nothing's even happened. Like, what, what, you're just watching people going, oh, well, I like him, I like her. I'm like, give them alcohol, give them 30 shots each, and then... And then, and then Liven them up a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it literally is like watching a real-life, just, like, crap love story. You know, when you're like, I've been watching this for 20 minutes, and one per I, I think one person chooses someone, don't they? And you're like, oh, they will pair up, I'm done. Bored. Yeah, I've done I tried. I'm, I'm always willing to give something a go, but that and Towie and Made in Chelsea, that, that whole genre of reality, I just don't get it. I don't I can, get it. I can it see nothing how we, for me. I can see how you get into it. Because I remember when I was younger, I used to get made to watch like Coronation Street and Extenders, and the more you watch them, the more you kind of get into the storylines. So I can kind of see it, but out of choice, nah, mate, not for me. Nah. Not for him. Uh, so we wrap that one on. Uh, up and I'm trying to find the questions now for you and all I can find is Instagram. So the really important questions. The big one, the big five. The big five. I don't even know where they are, mate. So I might have to just wing them. Um, number, oh, here we go. Number one. Um, I text it to you. Yeah, so your favourite drink or alcoholic drink, mate? Rum. Just rum, not even a particular one? Uh, rum. My, the favourites I've tried are 
the Malke flat label and a cane trader make a really nice blended rum. Do you have any is Straight? Uh, I would generally have like one shot, have it with a load of ice, and that one shot will last me like an hour and a half. Oh, nice. Because, nice. because you're not, I, I, for one, uh, for a birthday one year, I got taken to a, a whiskey tasting masterclass. And the way that you're supposed to drink a spirit is it's supposed to go into your mouth, you just let it flow around your mouth, and then you actually let it slide down your throat. Yeah. You don't actually swallow it. And I didn't know this. Like, I had no idea. I worked this um, on, on Christmas Day. My missus dad had been over to a whiskey masterclass, and about and they come with the expensive whiskey, and there's me yeah, yeah, yeah. little rum. Or <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, with the, so when I left the, uh, it was at the Capitol Hotel up in up in town, and uh, I left there. I was a little bit leggy on the way out. I was like, oh, let's go shopping. And missus was like. Let's not. <laughs> yeah, get that annex away. Um, number number two, favourite food. Can be healthy, unhealthy. Chocolate. I, I will take... So, the, I'm not sure if I'm proud or ashamed to admit this, but one Christmas, I smashed off three whole selection boxes by 11am. <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I'd, be, I'd be proud. I'd be proud. Um, Minus the curly whirlies, though. I can't do a curly whirly. It's too chewy. Yeah, I quite like I quite like a toffee penny now and then as well. Um, fa favorite body part to train, or favorite type of training, or favorite exercise? Uh, for me, it's very mood dependent, but I love a good leg session. Love a good leg session. The the the, the focus you need to go through for a real good leg session is unbelievable, and the pain afterwards, and just the pain while you're doing it, and then the reward at the other side of it, legs. Love it. Nice. And your dream job? I would love to get paid to travel around the world. So like a like an air steward? <laughs> Not so much in that respect. <laughs> like a flight attendant? <laughs> sort of, yeah, maybe not. Uh, like, a, uh, you know, like, the, like getting paid to go and do like hotel reviews or restaurant yeah, reviews. Yeah, like a like blogger that. or like, something. That's it, like a blogger, yeah, like a travel blogger or something like that. That would be yeah. awesome. That would be sick. You could just pick and choose your jobs. Oh, mate. Imagine getting paid to go to Bora Bora for two weeks. Oh, mate. Please. Sign me up. And your favourite music to train to? Again, very mood dependent. But, so I could only now, I, I could only get to three songs for this. Yeah, give us, give us three. What's your favourite right. genre, though? Say again? What's your favourite genre or type of music to train to, though? Uh, a combination of rock type of music or hip hop type music, Perfect. and if I can find a crossover between the two, happy days. And where are we uh, going? So, lose yourself, Eminem. Yeah. Rage Against the Machine, I love. Which is which... it's just um, what's the one they got to Christmas number one? Uh, Fuck you! I, yeah, I won't do what you tell me. Yeah, yeah, in killing in the name of killing. That's the one. Yeah. Uh, and the other one that really pumps me up, like whether it's mid set or at the start of a session, is the title music to the Superman movie, Christopher Reeve one. <laughs> Honestly, it. that yeah. music goes on and just, I can just feel my posture change when I hear it and just yeah. sets me up for a really good set. Love it. Nice. All right, awesome. So um, what's your sort of top tip for anyone watching or listening to live their kind of best life? A very short takeaway. I would say find something that you are unbelievably passionate about and just discard everybody else's opinion. If it makes you happy and it makes you feel good and it doesn't hurt other people, chase after that passion and do it to the best of your ability with as much time as you can give it. Nice. And then you're Keep indulging you all sides of yourself. Job done, man. Love it. And then finally, buddy, um, how can everyone find you for your coaching services, for your PT mentorship, etc.? So the PT mentorship, so you can find that on Instagram, on at 360 underscore fitness underscore coaching. You can find my one-to-one -one coaching or personal training services on Instagram again, at Coaching for Men, and you can find that website on www.coachingformen.net. 
And okay. likewise, there is also uh, 360fitnesscoaching.com. So one will be for like PT mentorships, the other will be for uh, one-to-one coaching, all to do with hormones, weight loss, mentality, side of coaching, all that jazz. Love it. I'll put the links in the description below so everyone can check you out there and you'll definitely be back on anyway because you yes i will about a million uh, <laughs> sorry <laughs> you know, it's like our own mentorship um dean i'll let you um i'll let you finish the show and say bye to everyone with whatever you want to say all right uh thank you for having me on thank you for listening i hope i made things clear and sensible and uh i'll be seeing you again thanks for tuning in <laughs>